Hi, I'm Chance. And I'm Sarah Catherine. And this is Conservation Connection. Presented by Last Chance Endeavors. We run a wildlife education nonprofit focused on connecting students to their environment. Each week here on Conservation Connection, we do just that by introducing you to the groundbreaking science and conservation work that's happening every day around the country. We talk to professionals in the world of conservation science and wildlife management and ask them about their career, their current projects, their wild and crazy stories from the field, and everything in between. Join us each week to discover just how these dedicated people are working to protect our planet. Alrighty guys, welcome to another episode of Conservation Connection. I cannot tell you how excited we are to be back here at Grace Marine Lab working with their research experience for undergraduate students again. Today we are here with Jake, Ellie, and Olivia, and we're just so excited to have you guys here. Welcome to the show, guys. Thanks for having Thank us. You. Yeah, thank you. Jake, why don't you go ahead and start and tell us a little bit about the research that you're doing. Okay, I'm looking at a uh, possible connection between sponges and coral reefs. Coral reefs give off this compound called DMSP, which is a very long word and very complicated and hard to say. Basically, all you really need to know about it is that through a series of complex interactions, it's broken down into sulfide, which provides material for clouds to build upon. And so nobody's ever looked to see how sponges could be affecting the production of this compound. And so my research is very much an if and then question, which means that if the sponges are consuming the DMSP and preventing it from getting to the atmosphere, what does that mean for the global climate? So I'm going to back this up a little bit. You're telling me that coral reefs have an effect on cloud creation? Yes. Can you give me a little more about that? Yeah. So uh, this DMSP, this compound that's produced, it breaks down into sulfide. And sulfide acts as cloud condensation nuclei, which is basically it's just this material that allows clouds to form around it. And the clouds, they get up to the atmosphere. And depending on the type of cloud, they are sometimes able to reflect the radiation from the sun and increase the Earth's albedo. Okay, and albedo being the... Reflectivity. So trending globally, right? Coral reefs are not doing great. No, not exactly. Right. (laughs) So how does that interplay with sponges? Are sponges seeing similar losses? Uh, Actually, they're not. Research has shown that they're a lot more uh, resistant to changes in seawater chemistry and just the ocean in general. And so what they're actually seeing is that sponges, they're creating what's called sponge reefs. And they're basically, they're filling this niche, this hole left by the dying reefs and kind of coming into that coral reef area. That's interesting because reefs are such a complex thing, right? On one hand, they're literally the coral animals that are building these hard, stony outcroppings. There are also all of the organisms that live on the reef, right? The fish, everything down to the plankton that depends on these reefs to survive. So... When those animals die off, you still oftentimes have a lot of that structure left behind. And I guess that's just like a free apartment for sponges to move right in and and set up shop, right? Yep. Just fill in a gap pretty much. That's cool. Okay. All right. I want to, we're going to come back to you, but (laughs) we have two other excellent researchers in the room um, and I want to talk a little bit about what we've got going on here. So Ellie, can you tell me a little bit about your project? So my research this summer is um, contrasting the algal physiology between invasive and native species right here in Charleston and looking at their competitive abilities to different habitats here. So basically what you're telling me is that you're looking at the algae that's found here, right? And seeing what conditions it's very happy in, what stuff it can tolerate, and comparing the ones that are from here originally to ones that kind of showed up a little more recently to see if that's going to cause a problem? Yes. So invasive species have been known to cause issues within different ecosystems, taking resources from the native species or modifying the habitat within that ecosystem. So I'm trying to figure out if there are certain characteristics within the invasive species here that allow it to adapt so successfully to the different habitat here? And if so, maybe using the strength or the weakness within that algae species to combat the introduction to the area or prevent the spread of the algae. So you're basically looking for like a hole in the armor, like some way to combat this invasive spread of algae in a way that helps to protect our native algae here. 
Yes. Cool. I like that. So uh, out of all of the things that you could have decided to do your research project on, assuming that you kind of came up with your own idea of what you wanted to study, what made you choose invasive species and more specifically algae? So algae became more of a passion for me when I was taking a phycology class this past semester with Dr. Heather Spaulding. It was a fascinating class and one of my favorites that I've taken. Phycology is? The study of algae. Okay, cool. That would make sense that you were interested in algae when you took a class (laughs) on the study of algae. Yeah, and then for the invasives, I think that it's going to become a very big issue with climate change happening, with different changes within the habitats, with acidity, salinity, temperature changes. And I think that invasives will start to become a bigger issue because of those changes and their ability to adapt so well to the changes. So I think that trying to help prevent the decrease in local biodiversity will help to keep ecosystems like the ones here in Charleston healthy. Awesome. Speaking of algae, we've got another (laughs) wonderful algae project in the room, and I'd like to hear a little bit about it. Olivia. Yes. So this summer, I'm comparing the microbiomes of seven intertidal seaweed species from Eva Beach, Hawaii. And right now, the beach that they were collected from is undergoing a lot of urbanization. So analyzing these microbiomes can really give us a good sense of their health. And if we have detected any changes in their health, then we can report that to local policymakers. So I know biome is like the savanna, the rainforest, but micro means tiny, right? So what is a microbiome on algae? Yeah, so all of us have little bacteria living on us or in us that help us perform our necessary functions. Like for humans, that's digestion um, and other functions like that. And every other organism also has that. So the microbiomes of algae are made up of tons of bacteria that um, help them perform necessary functions like photosynthesis and creating biofilms to protect them. Cool. So basically, I mean, it's just like when you go to the doctor and they check out what's going on inside your body to see if you're healthy. That's basically what you're doing with algae. Yeah. So analyzing these microbiomes can really give us a good sense of if they're still healthy or if there's any trends and changes in their health. Cool. So I think the important question here is, did you get to go to Hawaii? (laughs) Sadly, I can say I did not get to go to Hawaii, but it's okay because these algae are really, really pretty anyways, and I enjoy working with them. (laughs) Sort of imagining a tropical paradise as you're sitting there in the lab. It's okay. Maybe next time. Yeah. (laughs) So just so we can kind of get a better idea of where this algae is coming from, where exactly is Eva Beach? Is it Big Island? So Eva Beach is located near Honolulu on Oahu where there is a lot of people. I don't know if y'all know Hawaii, but Oahu is like, amazingly, this tiny tropical island is consistently rated for the worst traffic in the United States. So there's a lot of people there. Um, so it's it's a very sensitive ecosystem that has a lot of pressure being put on it right now by people. So it's very important that we're taking a look at what's there and how healthy it is and how well it's responding to the anthropogenic, the human-based changes, kind of like looking at how the algae here in the bay is responding to changes in the water parameters, right? The temperature, the salinity, the acidity and stuff like that. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, I'm also looking at native and invasive species as well to try and determine maybe we can get some sort of idea from their microbiomes, what has made them so successful in withstanding like local bacteria. Excellent. So let's back up and get to know you guys a little bit. So where is everybody from? (laughs) Why don't we start with you, Olivia? (laughs) Okay. Um, I'm from South Carolina. I'm from the upstate area near Spartanburg. Okay. I'm from upstate New York in Rochester, New York. Two very different upstates. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. And uh, I'm from the Midwest. I'm from Detroit, Michigan originally. Cool. Awesome. So this year, something interesting about the RAU program is that Due to COVID and trying to limit travel, all of you attend the College of Charleston, right? That's correct. Yes. Awesome. So uh, what made you guys choose the College of Charleston? And Jake, we can start with you. Well, you know, as someone growing up in the Midwest, the opportunities for marine biology are few and far between. Sure. Um, That's astounding. (laughs) Right? You know, who would have thought? I did my first year of college actually in Denver. 
going for environmental science. And my parents were like, hey, we're moving to South Carolina. You should transfer. And I was like, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great and idea. So I started looking at schools and I came across College of Charleston. And, you know, it's smaller. It's a much more uh, tight knit community. And also the fact that it's a liberal arts, it puts a lot of focus on the science and puts a lot of focus on giving students like us these opportunities that I really just don't think a lot of other places do. And so that's really what sold it for me. Okay, Ellie, what about you? I knew that I wanted to go into marine biology and environmental sustainability studies and looking into schools that could provide that. Um, when I came to the college and visited it, I completely fell in love with the city and thought that it would be the perfect place for me to continue my education. And that's all she wrote. <laughs> that was when I set foot at Davidson College the first time, which is where I did my undergrad. It was the same thing. Like I was like, oh, yeah, this is the right place. This feels right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what about you, Olivia? Yeah. So being from South Carolina, I vacationed here in Charleston a lot. And um, once I realized very early on that science was my passion, um, College of Charleston has an extremely strong science program, not just in marine sciences, because obviously we're here on the water. They have very strong STEM programs in general. Um, so that obviously was a criteria for me. And I also love the fact that the campus is integrated into the city. So I like being at the heart of everything. And what's that story that I saw when you were like, you realized at a very early age? What, <laughs> how did you realize that you were so into science? You know, I don't think that there is a time where I ever doubted that science was what I wanted to do. I grew up in the country, so I was always like playing outside with bugs and snakes and other things like that. And, yes. I, and I was obsessed with Animal Planet as a kid. Um, so yeah, I don't, there was never a time in my life where science wasn't the focus. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Sometimes it's just like kind of an innate passion and other Childhood times you passion. stumble across it, you know? Yeah. And yeah, that's really, really cool. With science being your passion, did you know you always wanted to work with algae and microbiomes or were you like, oh, I want to work with, you know, for me, I was like, I want to work with dolphins. How did you come upon that realization and how did you decide to do your project on that? So I have a very broad range of interests when it comes to the science field. There's not many organisms that I wouldn't be interested in. Um, I'm just so thankful that I get to do some sort of research. And I actually had no experience in phycology before this, but now I realize that I love it. So I definitely <laughs> will be taking phycology with Dr. Spalding. She'll be so happy um, to hear that. <laughs> yeah. I'm actually very excited about that. But yeah, this is my first time um, researching algae. Dr. Fullerton got me into it, and I really appreciate that. That's my mentor. I mean, there's just something about research, feeling like you're creating knowledge or looking at something that no one else has really considered before. I don't know. I just kind of always have the sense with almost 8 billion people on this planet that, like, everything I do, somebody else is doing at the same time as me. I'm not unique. There's tons of other people. But when you're doing research and you're looking at stuff and there's nothing in the literature that says anything about this thing that I'm looking at, that's kind of a really cool feeling. Well, yeah, and that process, it just comes like an addiction. Like, if you love it, you just want to keep doing it. Absolutely. People are like, how can you, like, sit and read manuscripts? They're so dry. And I'm like, no, they're amazing. They're so they're cool. fascinating. <laughs> Speaking of things that no one has ever seen before, uh, <laughs> as we were setting up for this podcast, I learned that two people in this room uh, may have discovered a new species of algae, and I want to hear about that. So Jake and Ellie, tell me about this experience with finding a new, possibly, potentially, we don't know yet. I'll say tentative. <laughs> tentative, right. Species of algae. Well, so Ellie and I were both in Dr. Spalding's phycology class. And uh, like she said, we went to all kinds of different sites to see what kind of algae was there. And at least I can say one of my favorite spots, I don't know about you, was uh, Huntington Beach State Park up in Merle's Inlet. And it's a little different environment than what we were going. We were doing a lot of boat docks, and this was uh, a jetty. And it's this, we find this bright red. It's almost pink. Yeah. It was almost, it was very leaf-like looking, if that helps. And it's just this bright red, almost pink. And it was everywhere. It was everywhere. And we collected so much of it. And we go back and we try to identify it with this very long, detailed book. You know, we were just coming up empty. We just didn't have anything for it. So we're uh, kind of working in conjunction with another lab in uh, UNC, UNC Wilmington. And we sent off the algae to be 
analyzed, and it came back that this species didn't really match anything. That's so cool. That's, I mean, that's so cool. <laughs> I wish I had a more constructive thing to say after that. But it's I don't, just extremely cool. <laughs> it's just extremely cool to like be, be the ones that bring that. that to the attention of science. That's yeah, it was, you know, you hear about like, you know, growing up, all these people that discover new species, you discover new places, and you're like, oh, God, I want to do that. But then as you get older, you're like, people know so much. So how much can you really discover? Yeah. And it was kind of insane that a class let alone uh, gave us that opportunity. Yeah. yeah, and it's such a cool looking algae. And when we first went, we went in February and it was a much smaller blade that uh, wasn't as bright pink and it wasn't very abundant within the jetty. And then a smaller group of us went back in May, April, April. or May. Yeah. And when we went back, it was so abundant and it was bright pink. You couldn't miss it. And it was giant blades. Isn't, so it was really exciting. Isn't it amazing how like there's this big charismatic species. I mean, as charismatic as algae can be, exactly. really, right? Big, bright pink, leafy algae that's growing everywhere that has never been described by science before. And it's not like you guys had to go on a like an unmanned rover 300 yards underwater to find this. It was like. Just hanging out. Yeah, it's, you know. a, it's a very popular fishing spot uh, at Huntington Beach State Park. And it's yeah, just it's, right it's not, there. It's not really hidden. That's so, so cool. Yeah, but we haven't found it in any other area. So oh, really? we've yep. only seen yeah, we've it only at found Huntington. It up there. Interesting. There's a, a theory that it might be, um, like I said, a lot of places were boat docks. So a little bit different uh, substrate would they be found on because these guys were found on a jetty. And so getting to those areas around here is a little bit more inaccessible. And, you know, undergrads are expendable, but not that expendable. So. <laughs> That's awesome. So I feel like we've talked a lot about algae. And I feel like <laughs> a lot of people don't care about algae. So they should. They should. <laughs> Why? should. Why should people care about algae? Algae purifies our water and also produces lots of oxygen. Yeah. It also provides a lot of services for the ecosystem for a bunch of other organisms. So what does that mean? They play roles such as they can be habitats for certain species or for certain species um, larvae, or they provide food for the species, and they also can prevent our coasts from being eroded, and there's a lot of there's a lot. benefits. <laughs> they're they're kind of like unsung heroes, right? I feel like a lot of times in conservation and science in general, there's a lot of focus on these sort of charismatic mega things you know whether it's like tigers or pandas and those are awesome and i'm not trying to like if you're if you're a panda <laughs> trainer and you want to be on the show please contact me but um you know those pandas wouldn't exist without bamboo right our reefs would not exist without algae the sort of stable environment that we have even i would go so far as to say that anything that breathes oxygen should be really happy that algae is around because as much as like rainforests and trees contribute to oxygen production through photosynthesis, right? So that's the basic thing that everything green does where they take sunlight, um, sunlight, CO2, and water combines to make sugars and oxygen. That's the basis of life, right? And then everything that walks around does the opposite of that where we convert sugars and oxygen into carbon dioxide that you breathe out when you exhale. So all of that oxygen that we use to like exist on a day-to-day -day basis, the vast majority of that comes from algae. Algae, right? Absolutely. So it's definitely one of those things where people are like, ew, pond scum? Gross. But it's something that we should all be very grateful for. Yeah. They also absorb CO2 from the environment, which is a big factor in how climate change is happening right now. So that's also very important. That's absolutely right. Do they have an effect on mitigating acidification by removing carbon dioxide? Because I know a big factor in the oceans being more acidic is carbon dioxide being dissolved into it, creating carbonic acid, right? So if they're pulling CO2 out of the water column, I wonder what effects that has on the pH of the water. Has anybody read a paper? You guys. I, I mean, it makes sense. I haven't read any papers. Yeah, so, I'm not exactly sure. So uh, in the psychology class, we all did a paper on a different topic. And uh, one of the, pap the paper I decided was crustless coral and algae. And this is, you know, calcifying algae. Okay. And so there was some research that suggests that uh, the algae can pull the CO2 out, but they also use it for calcification. And so but because of, you know, 
ocean acidification happening, it still kind of nets negatively, if that makes sense, where, um, you know, it helps a little bit, but it hurts more. Interesting. I'm, I'm going to have to do some research on this. Um, yeah, so algae are, are very important. I don't know that I would call them a keystone species because they're not a single species, but they're definitely one of those organisms that are like the basis of life, of the ecosystems that they're a part of. So it's really great to see people looking at that segment of our environment. I mean, seaweed are also very culturally significant, especially the species that I'm studying. They're from a very culturally rich place in Hawaii, and also humans consume it as well, if you like sushi. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, it's really important to keep our seaweed healthy. Yeah, just set a little precursor. You'll have Sophie on your show in a little bit, and she's going to talk to you a lot about edible seaweed. Yeah, so I'm very excited about about that. that. That's like a really big topic right now. Like everyone, I mean... If you're not in, like, the marine field, it's probably not <laughs> on your radar, but... Yeah, I think I saw it on Oprah the other yeah, day. Yeah, really. Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a hot topic in the marine field, for sure. And there's a lot of talk about farming seaweed as a food source for a food-instable future, right? So something that is more easily grown, has a lower carbon footprint, and has a higher nutrition than some of the other foods that we're growing commercially right now. We should find somebody to interview about that. That will be Sophie. Sophie. That's Sophie. <laughs> She's doing That's aquaculture. Sophie. Success. Yeah. Good. Hey, Good. we should interview Sophie tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about algae, which is great. I do want to hear more about the sponges from Jake because I am. Um, I liked your brief little overview, but I really want to learn more. So yeah, tell us what you've found, why you're interested in it. Um, so as far as why I'm, I'm interested in it, I'm a little bit more broad. Like Olivia said, she was. It's really the ecology that I really like, especially coral reef ecology, because the interactions are so complex, and you really get to the point where you can't really affect anything without affecting everything. I mean, that's what ecology is, yeah. right? It's like how living things interact with non-living things and vice versa, or how living things interact with other living things. It's just like, how do things interact with each other, which is somehow the most broad possible <laughs> way to look at environmental science, but is a, a really, it's my favorite. By it's far my favorite fun. as well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that pretty much just kind of got me into it and just talking to my mentor, Dr. Chris Freeman and Dr. Peter Lee, about the research they were doing and just kind of wanting to get me involved. So obviously you're kind of continuing the research that your mentors are doing, kind of hopping on that research a little bit. Have y'all found anything surprising during your time at the REU experience? So the sponges were collected by Summerlin Key in the Florida Keys, and they were collected not at a nursery site, but near a nursery site. And so we're actually seeing initial results of our DMSP. Uh, We've got some of those results back, and they're fairly low, which is interesting because we were actually expecting to see some. And one theory that that I have, and I've talked to one of my mentors about, is that because, you know, coral reefs are dying across the world, um, including in the Florida Keys, so we don't think that there was that high, the initial concentration of uh, DMSP. And so that might explain it. But the other thing is... is, um, Without getting too much in-depth into it, DMSP breaks down to DMS, which is dimethyl sulfide, which is so much easier to say. (laughs) And so we're actually also looking to see if the sponges, maybe they're not absorbing the DMSP, but maybe it's the DMS that's broken down. And so that data is still very much pending. And why is it vital for sponges to have this? So that's a great question. It's very unknown, really. Nobody's ever looked at DMSP in sponges. But they do have pretty complex microbial communities. So similar to what uh, Olivia said about the bacteria living in organisms, it's the same idea with sponges, and they could be using the DMSP for any number of regulatory purposes. That's fascinating. Hypothetically. (laughs) We don't (laughs) hypothetically speaking. And just out of curiosity, I know you said it's hard to say, but I've heard you say DMSP a lot, and we might have some people who want to know what that actually means. Okay, which is, I'm going to butcher it, so don't hold it to me. So it's uh, dimethyl sulfonylpropionate. Awesome. I like it. Thank you. I think that's like 40-something points in Scrabble. I know, right? I think I win. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know if there's enough letters on the Scrabble board to spell that out. Definitely. That's why we're not saying it. (laughs) (laughs) Good job. Good on you. Yeah. So did you get to go down to the Keys to collect these samples? I I did, actually. So uh, as an undergrad, I'm not able to scuba dive, and these were collected off the ocean floor, so I wasn't necessarily part of the collecting but I was snorkeling from the top, uh, taking pictures and observing everything. That's awesome. So it was a, it was a good time. You're still in the water. It counts. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I want to know a little bit about what y'all's 
data collection looked like, right? Because, you know, sometimes somebody else does all the setup and you get handed some numbers. And other times you're the one that's out slogging through the pluff mud trying to find these turtles or whatever. So, like, Ellie, what does your data collection look like? So, um, my lab partner, Sophie, who you'll talk to later, we have all the same sites and the same algae species. So, we went out together to seven different sites and collected the species of algae. We collected six replicates of each and then brought it back. And I'm using a PAM fluorometer to test for photosynthetic efficiency. So we brought it back and then I run all the tests on that. And then we have to dry the samples in an oven for a day or two. And then we grinded up the samples and put them into little vials and sent them off to a lab in Hawaii. They're going to run the tests on the algae for stable isotopes. And Sophie's doing another part, but those are the two that I'm doing. That sounds like every science montage I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> like, out in the field, snipping these bits of algae, and then we take them and like swirl them. them around in Erlenmeyer flasks after we've ground <laughs> them down. So I want to know a little bit more about the photosynthetic efficiency. So what I am imagining is um, you're basically bringing them back, shining a light on them, and then measuring how much photosynthesis happens? So the PAM mimics, basically, there's different settings, but it basically mimics the light that the algae would be absorbing within its environment. So the availability and the intensity of the light within that environment, and I change the settings for that. And once it pulses a light onto the algae, it takes all the readings about the fluorescence, how fast the algae is able to absorb that light and use it for photosynthesis, and how effective it is and efficient it is at doing photosynthesis. So it literally measures the light being bounced off of the algae. Is that right? It takes readings from the algae once that light pulses. That's really interesting because if I if someone was like, hey, I need you to measure the photosynthesis of this algae, I would say like, OK, let me shine a line on it and put it in a box and measure the change in like CO2 and O2. Right. So I have a sense of how much of this photosynthetic reaction is happening. But the, the fact that there's tools where you can just basically pulse a light at it and it'll be like, oh, here's your readout, because I assume you're not like surveying the algae like, excuse me, how great was that light for you? Can you tell me <laughs> that's that's really an interesting tool to look at kind of how that algae is is interacting that's cool and so you had to send it out to hawaii that's the closest place to do that stable isotope research <laughs> i'm not sure if it's the closest place but dr spaulding has colleagues that work there and they do a lot of work for her so okay that makes sense mm -hmm. and what about you olivia what's your data collection look like yeah so dr spaulding who we've talked about is working in collaboration with my mentor and i my mentor is dr heather fullerton and then another grad student gabby kuba the three of them went to hawaii and collected our species from an intertidal zone um, they were collected in triplicate seven species for five days water control samples were collected with that at well and then they were preserved and frozen and brought back to me I've been extracting DNA, and I'm going to run qPCR, which quantifies the total abundance of bacteria once we've standardized the samples. And so that can allow me to establish um, bacterial load abundance in their microbiomes. So it's a lot of desk work. It's a lot of, like, working with... It's a lot of bench work, which I really enjoy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's good. That yeah, is good. I enjoy it a lot. That's cool. Kind of as we wrap up here, I want to go around and hear from all of you what your favorite part about your time in the REU has been. And if anyone has a recommendation to any students uh, who are looking to get into this field or do something similar. Olivia, why don't we start with you and just how your experience has been? Um, this is definitely the highlight of my academic career so far. I've been so thankful for this program. It's not often that you as an undergrad are federally funded and are provided with the opportunity to do your research. Some advice to um, interested students. Science has to be your passion. It can't be anything money related. It has to strictly be passion based. 
Yeah. yeah, definitely. I would agree with that. It's got to be something you have to love what you're doing if you're yeah. going to do it all day long. Yeah. yeah. And we hear that from students. We hear that from professors. Everyone's like, you really have to love science. Like, be sure you love science. And if you decide like you get into it and you're like, oh, I don't love this, then that's OK. Choose something else. <laughs> or find a way to take what you've learned and what you're passionate about and bring them together somehow. Yeah. And what about you, Ellie? I have also been so thankful for the REU program as I think that this is an amazing opportunity for undergrads to conduct research that I think has been so fun and has also given me so much education on what I want to do in the future and experience what real research and conducting an entire experiment by yourself is like. Yeah. I mean, with help from um, your mentor and everything. But still, you're the one driving the train. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's super exciting. Just doing science is really exciting. And there has been bumps in the road and figuring out how to move around them. It's really fun. And for advice, I guess I also agree that it has to be a passion and love for science. But I think that if you do think that you might be interested, in, I would say try it. And I would encourage anyone to go into science because science is so important for our world right now. So I like that you say try it because it's from the outside. You'd be like, I mean, sure, algae, I'm sure they're cool or whatever. And then you get into it and you're like, no, this is really cool. Yeah, so important. Yeah, yes. yeah absolutely. So I, I like that. Try it and try different things, you know. OK, so maybe you're not going to fall in love with algae, but you might fall in love with you know, cyanobacteria, or you might fall in love with different groups or whatever. So just try it. Mm -hmm. Science, just try it. <laughs> <laughs> and Jake, what about you? I sound a little bit like an echo. Um, yeah. But yeah, I've been unbelievably grateful for this experience. You know, the research and being um, getting a lot of freedom too to really design your own schedule. And, you know, the mentors are there to help as much as pretty much you'll let them, which is a great opportunity. But the other thing comes in with the research is we're also getting lessons in like scientific communication, developing posters. We're going to develop a manuscript at the end of the summer. So very much looking forward to that. But it's all been um, you know, just incredibly valuable experience. And we've had people come talk to us about grad school. And, you know, a lot of things that I've heard is things like the REU and the experience we're getting are just really helping to set us up for future success, which, again, I'm just internally grateful for. Yeah, that's awesome. Some advice, um, you know, it can be really just as simple as asking. I am in this position for a number of reasons, but I think the main reason is because on my first day of class with my professor who turned up to be my mentor, Dr. Chris Freeman, I went to him and I was like, okay, this is me. This is what I'm about. I want to do research. I know a lot of places it's reserved for upperclassmen and graduate students, but I'm impatient <laughs> and I don't want to wait. What can I do? What can I help you with? And that's pretty much how I got to this. He just came to me uh, sometime in... I think it was February or January, and was like, this other person and I are going to apply for research, and you should try to do the REU with it. And so it's, it's really just as simple as just to ask, and it never hurts. And more often than not, you're going to get the help you want because they want to help you. And you think that people do it. You think like, oh, everybody asks. No. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody asks. It can really just be that simple sometimes. Yeah. The other thing I'm hearing is that impatience pays off, which is good for me because I'm not a very patient person. So Persistence is key. Yes. yes. Persistence is key. Absolutely. Definitely just being willing to put yourself out there and be like, hey, how can I get involved? Which I think is true in science, absolutely. But I think it's true in a lot of things. I mean, with our nonprofit, that's why we're here is because we emailed Dr. Podolsky and we're like, hey, can we come? He was like, yeah, sure. Come on. Well, guys, I have had a great time chatting with you all. I'm so excited to see where your projects go. And I'm going to drop a link in the show notes to y'all's blog posts. So if anybody is listening to this and wants to read a little bit more about these projects, they can find them. And thank you so much for being on the show. Thank, thank you so you, much for having you. us. Thanks for listening to this episode of Conservation Connection. If you enjoyed our podcast, go ahead and subscribe to make sure you catch every episode that we post. We'd love to hear from you. So if you want to reach out, go to our website, lastchanceendeavors.com backslash contact and shoot us an email. We love questions from our listeners. So if you heard something that you want to know more about, be sure to let us know. If you've got a minute to spare, leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts will help other conservation-minded people find the show. We'd really appreciate it. 
A big thanks to the people working to protect our planet, and a big thanks to you for listening. Don't forget to tune in next week.